In the summer of 2005, retired merchant marine captain Charles Lindell was a passenger on an Aurora Expeditions trip to Commonwealth Bay, Antarctica. Charles decided before the trip that he would use the time on board to make a model of Mawson's hut at Commonwealth Bay. And I thought in the night one night, I'll make a model of Mawson's hut. And I thought, a bit old hat, you know, for heaps of people made models of Mawson's hut. But in the three weeks I had, I made uh, strenuous efforts to collect stuff, and uh, mainly balsa wood. And I thought, well, the hut's old, so I want the model to look old. So I got all these strips and sheets of balsa wood, and uh, I soaked it, then I salted it, and then I drove staples into it, and I wrapped it up in polythene, and I didn't look at it again until I got to the Chamberlain Hotel, or the Hobart, the hotel. It looked perfect. And uh, when I got on the ship, I found that uh, the four carpenters were on the ship, volunteers going down to uh, do restoration work on the hut. All I had up to that date was a plan and an elevation of the hut uh, that was in this book that my daughter won. So, and then uh, people, see, almost before I'd started, people would say, oh, we believe you're doing a model of Morris's hut. And they're coming around and wanting to photograph just a few sticks. So I thought, well, I've got to make a good job of this. Anyway, uh, I surprised myself and this talk isn't about Morrison's hat, but I did surprise myself with what, what, what I was capable of doing. I didn't know. I hadn't done any modelling since I was a schoolboy. Anyway, this trip came out, and this second trip, I never thought I'd come again. But uh, one has to. And I thought, well, what am I going to do uh, this time? And. Uh, it was Sid Kirkby, uh, he was a sledger, a dog team uh, fellow from the 1950s, and he was on this ship last time. And he said, why don't you do a model of Nancy, uh, Nancy Sledge? So um, I knew that was what I would have to do. Sid had been an expedition leader in charge of dog teams at Mawson Station in the 1960s, and had built his own sledges in the past based on the Nansen design. Sid provided Charles with a design plan and all the necessary information for building the sledge. When I was a geology student at Adelaide University, Professor Mawson's Nansen sledge from his Antarctic journeys was a feature on top of the display cases in the rock collection. It is now in the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. The main body of Nansen's sledge was made from ash and the runners from elm, shod with steel. All the joints were lashed with leather straps and twine during 2007, Charles started collecting the various authentic materials, ash, elm, leather and metal fixings that were used on the original sledge. So I had a bit more time this time, collected uh, timber, tried to make it authentic in, in terms of materials and used my uh, ageing techniques, which turned some of it black. So I thought, oh, well, you know, I can always rub the black off. Runners were steamed, uprights crafted, and the cane bow piece curved all prior to departure. And so um, I uh, bent fabricated sections, boiled timber and had a jig made, and uh, screwed this, um, the wood to this jig. And of course, take it off the jig and all the timber wanted to do was straighten up again. So I cut up a bicycle rim and uh, 
strap the uh, curve bits here to bits of bicycle room, put it all in a box with heaps of tools, and um, it was 22 kilograms. I asked Aurora if they could put it on the ship for me, which they said, no what? so they did. Uh, so all I had to do really was uh, assemble the, the parts. As soon as he was settled on board Marina Sveteva, Charles got to work. He quickly sequestered a corner of the table in the library, set up his jig and began the long process of assembling the model. And uh, it was a bit laborious. Took a bit longer than I expected. I'd been up there three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, five o'clock at the latest every morning. And uh, it come, come together quite well. Here's Charles hard at work on his Nansen sledge Nansen recreation. Type sledge. Nansen type. Okay, well, you better fill us in, Charles. What's the story? Well, Nansen invented this sledge about 1880, I think, 1880 something, and uh, his most famous sledge is uh, built on the Fram when he was uh, finding the way to the North Pole aboard the Fram. And uh, since then, everybody realised that he'd got the best sledge ever made, and for the next 70 years, all the explorers used, virtually all the explorers used the Nansen sledge, and, uh, but it developed over the 70 years and, uh, and had, had metal in it, metal pins, metal brackets, uh, which Nansen sledge didn't. Okay. Nansen sledge was all uh, hickory and ash and it was all pinned, all um, mortised together and bound with uh, raw hide and cord, leather, all natural materials. And uh, what made it so much better than the conventional sledges at the time. It was flexible, it was light, it was easily dismantled and rebuilt, and it was reversible. Ah, what do you mean okay. reversible? If they, if they bashed up the front end, right. they could oh. undo it, mm. turn it round, and put the, uh, what do they call it, the hoop on the front, they could put it on the back and still keep going. That's nice. And of course, Mawson cut his in half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in our uh, museum. It's in, I saw it in the um, Antarctic Division. No, the, the one he cut in half is in the, in the South Australian Museum there with his sleeping bag rolled up on the end. In Adelaide? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, 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 that's right, okay. Um, that must be um, a replica in no, it's the a real one. Antarctic Division. quite a lot to do, I won't finish it on the ship. What I'm trying to do is, is get it into a uh, condition, you know, with a, call it a cow catcher for some reason, on the front. I'll get it out of yeah. And then they uh, thread a rope through there and they sort of loop it back and then there's another dog's pull from there. So I'm going to get the front bridge on and the rear bridge and, and that on. And then, when we get in the ice, which we certainly will in the ship, we go down the uh, gang gangway. Yeah. Bob Segan is with me, you see. And all these guys are going to photograph it and make it look like a real one. Oh, yeah. What are those for? They're the handles. Oh. For the, for the, the men that are sort yeah. of running at the back of the sledge, they okay. sort of push or hang on. I've, got to, I've just got to make little, How high do they? Make little grips for these, you know. And of course the bloke's standing oh, on the platform yeah, on the yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When the dogs when, are going well. When he was going downhill yeah. or whatever. Yeah. The dogs don't get much rest. No. I think they did more sitting on the sledge than they admit. <laughs> the old uh, heroic yeah. and talk to mm. heroes. <laughs> Oh, me? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I should get some good pictures of uh, the, the wealth of talent on the board of this ship. They should come up with some really good uh, 
Because I can't take myself. Ooh. And I'm not the best photographer anyway. Charles managed to complete the sledge just in time to take it for a test drive at Scott's Terranova Hut on Saturday the 16th of February, two weeks after departing Bluff. The sledge was man-hauled by Charles just as Scott's team did in 1911 and 12 across to the Terranova Hut to provide an appropriate background for some photographs. You really couldn't find a more authentic backdrop in the world for the model than this one. to uh, go on much longer but I would just like to say what what the things are on the sled. Now we have some very knowledgeable people on this ship and I might be talking a certain amount of rubbish that the sled is loaded really as a as a sledge right of the Scots Scots era uh, where the sledge is built as a 1930s era. So I call it a hybrid, <laughs> but probably on the less uh, flattering terms. But um, it's a complete mixture of styles. A lot of these guys apparently made their own sledges uh, in the 30s. I so when they were on the stations, Dave probably uh, knows about this. And so the sledges were individual, uh, and this is individual. And some of the purists among you were saying, should it have all this metal in? Well, you can't see much metal now, but uh, the, uh, I just wanted to give it strength, and I, I didn't want to cut these uh, arches, so I just could lift them complete. And the thing is very, very strong, and uh, I'll try to sort of stain it up. Anyway, the load, uh, on the back here, that's my, uh, it's quite a nice thing, my wife stitched it up, but it's my own design, it's a food bag, and it ties on the bottom with eyelets, and there's a little plywood so that it sits on the sledge, and they used to fill that with all manner of things, you know, from penguin steaks to uh, dog's brains, so you can use your imagination as to what went in that. And the box on the front obviously was extremely important for the stove. The stove and the fuel for it was one of the most important things. And the navigation instruments, a uh, sextant uh, type thing. And their diaries, they all kept diaries. So I would say they kept them in, in the box. And then there was the tent. Uh, which is just uh, mocked up uh, there. This clip is from the film The Great White Silence, released in 1924 by Herbert Ponting. Ponting was the professional photographer and cinematographer on Scott's last expedition. 
The silent film has been beautifully restored by the British Film Institute National Archive, who acquired the original negatives from Herbert Ponting's estate in 1944. Frame by frame, the film was reconstructed with Ponting's original tinting and toning. You can view the whole one hour 47 minute film on YouTube. And I thought, well, I read a lot of books recently on this, only since I knew I was coming on this cruise. I thought it's quite often guys themselves, uh, sick or whatever, would carry it on on the sledge. So I've got my neighbour organised, my wife organised, my daughter organised. And together we came up with this uh, mannequin. And uh, I was jokingly saying that's uh, Shackleton. Because uh, Shackleton was pulled on the sledge by Scott and Wilson on their first polar effort. And he became sick. And he got scared. Ernest Shackleton himself not looking at all well, resting on the sled, and uh, looks remarkably like Charles actually. Anyway, I've upset a lot of people on the ship by referring to that as uh, Shackleton because whilst it's the truth, it's not their perceptions of, or memories of Shackleton, who was a great hero of course. So we've decided it's Spencer Smith, <laughs> it was the Reverend Spencer Smith of the Ross Sea Party, who was dragged many hundreds of miles on the, on the sledge. The sail is, uh, they used to use the floor cloth as a sail, and when they were very lucky they could, they could put the sail up to a considerable assistance, sometimes too fast. This is another clip from The Great White Silence, showing the use of the tent floor as a sail. Sometimes the uh, sledge in one occasion went so fast that it got away from the guys because they were mostly pulling them by and manhauling them. And uh, the sledge got away from these guys and they weren't going to let it go, they had to leave on. So that was their lifeline and the sledge went faster and faster and faster and they were headed for this crevasse. And the sledge leapt the crevasse and landed them in a heap of snow on the other side. These are just, I think it was, uh, I forget who it was, it was the Ross Sea Party anyway. It wasn't the popular heroes. So I think that's all I've got to say really, but I've gone on a bit longer than I thought. If anybody's got any questions, you can ask Dave in the bar there. <laughs>